Welcome back to a year of Final Fantasy and today we're going to be talking about the one and only Final Fantasy VIII. And boy is there a ton to talk about, so let's just jump into it. As always, let's start off with the release data, then we'll get into the real meat of the game of Final Fantasy VIII. It was originally released on February 11th, 1999, about half a year later, so it came out on September 9th and October 27th for the States and Europe respectively on the PlayStation. And in December of the same year it came out for PC, and the director was Yasunori Tassi, who we've talked about at length before, and as far as the art goes, we have Suzuki Nayora, sorry if I mispronounced that name, and they have slipped into the role coming off of Final Fantasy VII. At this point, Amano isn't really taking a large role in the art as he did with the previous earlier games. And of course, I do need to mention the composer, as always, is the one and only Nobuo Uematsu. We'll dive into the music later in this video, so just sit back and relax. Let's go ahead and talk about the biggest point of the game. Well, I don't know, maybe not the game as an entity but this is really the first game in the franchise that really honestly truly divided the fan base whereas before most of the talk between the games were simply you know if you preferred them or not most people enjoyed them this particular game though was completely and utterly divided for fans with a multitude of reasons and it's good to note that so what are some of these reasons well you know let's take a look at a few of them so i think the first and easily probably the largest complaint is the twist of the game and that's all i can possibly say here just making this a spoiler free video and that's pretty much where I'm going to leave it. Moving on from that, the narrative, people also have issues with the main villain just in general, which I'll discuss a little bit more in depth whenever we get to the characters and the villains and all of that later on. I guess probably also the last big point is how they handled the magic system and the battle system. And if you want a brief overview of it, you can check out the last episode that I put out called Battle Systems, which goes over pretty much the entirety of the combat in the Final Fantasy series, at least the major titles. But we can go into it a little bit more in depth right here. A lot of people thought that the way that the magic was handled and how it was used in the game really wasn't necessarily a good game design. Now, I'm not here to give you my thoughts on the matter, really. I just want to make you aware of it. To give you an overview, we'll go ahead and talk a little bit more in depth about it. So magic summons in the battle system are incredibly different in Final Fantasy VIII. While the system is essentially an ATB, active time battle, it hasn't really changed in that respect in any major way since Final Fantasy, what, 4 it was introduced in. So all of the action economy and all of that, it's pretty much the same standard fare as Final Fantasy. The real change comes from those actions that flow in battle via the magic and the summoning system. Summons are a huge part of Final Fantasy VIII, not only within battles in a mechanical sense, but they also have major story implications. I'd say that the game focuses on summons possibly more than any other game in the series. The only one that would, I don't know, maybe come close would be Final Fantasy X, which probably, honestly, would be on par with how it shapes the storyline. Regardless, I'm not here to convince you which one is the more summon-filled game. Uh, that would actually be Final Fantasy VI, but rather, I just want to emphasize the fact that this game really relies on summons and what they do in the context of battles. Obviously, you can summon them and they appear and attack like you normally would think, but the way that the progression of the characters occurs in Final Fantasy VIII really doesn't solely rely on leveling as it used to. This is a radical departure from the series of games in the past. While there are levels in the traditional game, the game scales with those levels, and this is the first game to really do that. Sometimes the game actually becomes much more difficult the higher level that you are. And the other side to that progression, not just leveling, is that you can improve your character with this thing called the junctioning system. Now, the overview of this is that you can tie various magic spells to character stats and improve them depending on how much magic you've associated or junction to them. For instance, just as an example, cure magics would increase HP a lot, haste magics would increase speed, and different magics affect different stats in various ways, like HP, strength, luck, spirit, vitality, all of that stuff. And even furthermore, you have statistics like your elemental affinity which you can, for instance, say junction fire to your fire affinity and you can lessen or even absorb fire attacks. It's incredibly intricate, most people find it overly complicated at the beginning, and to be honest it does take some time to get used to, but it's really not that bad once you get your mind around the basics, and in this way, Junctioning magics allows you to do low-level runs of the game, and if you're good enough, you can completely destroy the game if you know what you're doing and you have a system mastery over the mechanics of the junctioning system. Furthermore, actually how you physically junction the magic to your stats is the fact that it has to go through these summons. So you junction summons to yourself, like Ifrit, and they will allow you to apply these magics to your stats and then raise yourself up 
like that. So it really depends on how many summons that you have in the game, and those summons have an affinity with the character. Sometimes they'll get more powerful if they like a particular character, more or less. So there's that level of play going on as well in the battle. While all of that is fine, the single issue that a lot of people have with this system is the way that magic itself is handled. This is the first game in which you do not use magic in the same way with magic points or MP or if you really want to go old school with the spells that are like Final Fantasy 1 with the Vancey and Magic spells per day system. Here, magic is drawn from enemies or magical nodes on the map, and they're basically stored up, and you can store up to 100 kinds of each spell. So whenever you use it, it depletes by one. And that in and of itself isn't really that bad. But you have to remember that magic is actually tied to the stats. So let's say you have some cure junction to your HP stat or your vitality or whatever, each time you use a cure, it uses the magic, and that magic is depleted, and since your HP is tied to that magic, your HP actually depletes. So it's a pretty big trade-off of whenever you use magic, how it will affect your actual character in the game. And that's pretty much how the progression of this works, and it's really interesting. It's a, you know, price trade-off. And I've personally never had a problem with it, but I've seen the game exploited, and people can absolutely demolish the game, like I've said before. I've also seen people try and over-level because they don't necessarily understand this system, and they basically will get to a point where the monsters are so incredibly powerful because they scale with you that you just simply can't proceed. And if you don't have a good handle on that junctioning system, then you're basically stuck in the game unless you do some hardcore research and see how you can get yourself out of that mess. So it's certainly a malleable system, and you should play the game for yourself to find out whether you like it or not. And I find that people either really like it or really hate it. There's not really an in-between for whatever reason. But for me, I like the system, but that being said, I pretty much like all the Final Fantasies. So, you know, don't take my word for it. Go play it yourself. All right, so that was a ton of time spent on the intricacies of combat and progression. And, you know, I did talk a little bit about the summons briefly via junctioning, but I think it's worth the time to take a look at the entire list of summons here because they do take center stage. It's one of the big plot points of the game. Summons in this game are known as Guardian Forces, or GFs for short, and you attune them to yourself by junctioning, and they guide your growth as a character, as I mentioned before. And they allow you to use different abilities and commands and all kinds of different stuff. They're basically the lifeblood of the game. So let's go over each of them fairly quickly and give them the center stage that they deserve. There are 16 summons in the game, which is actually quite a few. However, the game with the most summons I think I mentioned before is Final Fantasy VI, so just to clarify. But anyway, let's see what we have here, and I'm going to just kind of go in order as they appear on the screens. So first off, we have Quetzalcoatl standing in as one of the first summons that you get, replacing the long-loved Ramu, or Rama if you're in Final Fantasy XV for whatever reason, as your de facto lightning summon. Quetzalcoatl is a god of lightning and storms originating in ancient Native American tribes, and it's clear from that, you know, whenever you summon him. He's a really cool summon, and honestly, I like him just as much as Ramu, actually. It's a very cool trade-off. Speaking of cool, sorry for the bad pun, next we have Shiva, basically one of the big summons that appears in pretty much every Final Fantasy game, save for a couple of them. If you want to know more about Shiva, we did a summon video specifically over her, Ifrit, and Ramu, and you know, I'm not going to go into a lot of it here because we've covered it extensively in pretty much all the games. So she's our ice summon, and honestly, little more needs to be said. Next we have Ifrit, same thing applies to him as Shiva, except Ifrit is our fire summon, and like I said, we've already covered him exhaustively, so I'm just going to move on. Siren is a returning summon from Final Fantasy VI, and she's a summon with no elemental ability, but can silence enemies. She's the weakest summon overall and the offensive capabilities, but she has some really good abilities whenever you junction her, and obviously the ability to cast silence on enemies that can cast major spells is very helpful. Next up, we have Brothers, and Brothers is a pretty interesting one. It's actually two characters. They appear together, and they're Minotaurs, and they are illusion to the Final Fantasy V Sekhmet and Minotaur enemies, and this is the first and pretty much the last appearance of them as a summon. The larger one is named Minotaur, and being a Minotaur it's kind of weird, but it's what it's named, and the smaller one is actually named Sacred. They are the game's Earth Elemental Summon, replacing what we normally know to be as Titan. So that's, you know, pretty interesting, and actually whenever you get them, you're kind of wandering around this maze of corridors, which draws back to the mythological Minotaur aspect, Minotaur in the Labyrinth. Next up, we've talked about this one as well, pretty in-depth, and that is Diablos. And Diablos comes in the form of a red and black winged demon and is an optional summon. You can actually skip him altogether. He uses the Dark Messenger attack, 
which is a gravity based attack and it deals a percentage of your HP in damage depending on his level. Carbuncle returns as the adorable little rabbit type creature which we've also covered in a summon video. Here he casts Ruby Light which gives the characters Reflect and that's pretty much all he does. He's not an offensive summon but it is incredibly helpful in a lot of battles and obviously he's adorably cute. However, be warned if you look up Carbuncle on Google you're going to find some really nasty images because it means something else completely in the medical world. Next up would be Leviathan which we've already talked about before as well. So he appears with his Tsunami dealing water-based damage, and in fact he was the first summons that people knew about in Final Fantasy VIII because he was actually in the demo that people got to play before the actual game came out. And we talked about him extensively in a few videos ago dealing with the Biblical summons. And Leviathan is honestly one of my favorite summons, at least visually. Next up we have Pandemona, and it's a rather odd guardian force that's a wind-based attack creature which sucks up the enemies in his giant uh, air sack bag thing. I don't, I don't know what you would call that, but his attack is called Tornado Zone and he spits them out dealing wind based damage and interestingly enough the way that you obtain this GF is drawing him from a character named Fujin which is actually a word for the Japanese god of wind. The next GF that we can get is himself optional as well. Most of these GFs are actually optional that you can miss if you don't draw them from a particular character at a particular time but Anyway, this one is called Cerberus, and most people know Cerberus from mythology as the three-headed dog that guards hell or the underworld or, you know, whatever kind of mythology you're looking at. He has an ability that is used whenever you summon him called Counter Rockets that actually don't deal damage at all, but they give you the ability of double or triple, which allows you to cast two or three spells in a single turn. It's very useful. Next up we have the awesome Alexander, which again, we had talked about him with our biblical summon video, and he deals holy damage from his holy judgment attack. Love Alexander, he's always a sight to behold whenever you summon him. Our next one is probably one of the strangest and one of just the most like WTF summons, and it's amazing, and it's Doom Train which is probably a callback to the Phantom Train boss in Final Fantasy VI, and generally there's a, a kind of folklore about ghost trains in the southern parts of North American folklore, and I do live in the southern parts of North America in Texas, so it's really kind of interesting how that's evolved, and obviously Rick and Morty has a character that summons ghost trains. I wish he had the ability to check his attitude. Alan Rails, ladies and gentlemen. After his parents' tragic death in a railroad accident, he gained the power to summon ghost trains. It's not all bad, though. They were spared having to see their grown son wear a whistle. God damn! Thanks, Noob Noob. He deals poison element damage and is basically about as close as you're going to get from a Marlboro summoning attack, dealing several different status effects such as sleep, poison, darkness, silence, slow, stop, berserk, confused, doom, petrifying, and if you're lucky, vitality zero. Next up, we have Bahamut, which I'll be dedicating an entire summon episode to Bahamut in his many forms throughout the franchise. Otherwise, the least you need to know here is that Bahamut is a recurring summon in just about every Final Fantasy game ever, and he has a variety of attacks, usually in some form of non-elemental mega flare. Bahamut is a staple summon of the series and he's gotten more and more attention as the franchise has progressed which we'll see whenever we get into these later entries. And the next two summons that we have are actually part of my first random battle episode where we look at the iconic Final Fantasy enemies and that is Cactar and Tonberry. Now to be clear those aren't the same summon we're dealing with two different summons one is Cactar and one is Tonberry so it's not like a brother's thing here. Both are optional summons as you might expect. Cactar deals his signature 1000 thousand needle attack which actually is based on the number of the level that is at the beginning of the cactar level and if you level him up to 100 he's just going to be dealing 10,000 damage which actually breaks the 9,999 damage barrier and is one of the first in the franchise to break that barrier. Tonberry let's shift over attacks with his chef's knife dealing random non-elemental damage and honestly there's not a lot more to say about Tonberry. He takes a lot to get though that's probably the thing that I remember the most. You have to fight so many many Tonberries, and his hilarious animation for summoning is always a joy to behold. Last up, at least for the big summons, is the big summon of the game, and that is Eden, which we actually talked about in our Biblical Summons video as well, and there's not necessarily a ton to say about Eden, but it is the most powerful summon in the game by far, and it's one of the most prominent in the series other than the Cactar at level 100 because Eden is the first to completely shatter the 9999 damage limit barrier, which completely blew me away 
away whenever I obtain this summon. Eden clearly refers to the Garden of Eden, which actually ties into the game's story of these gardens as military educational facilities. And those are our summons, and there are a ton of them, but with the game so heavily featured around the idea of guardian forces, it fits perfectly. I do want to mention here that there are some other summons, ones that didn't explicitly provide themselves in such an apparent way, such as Phoenix and Odin. Whenever given the right circumstances, they'll pop up every now and then, assuming that you've done the thing to get them. Other than that, there are lesser known summons. There's Gilgamesh, which we've actually done a summon video on. Check that out because Gilgamesh is one of the most interesting characters in the franchise that actually ties all of them together. It's really interesting. And aside from him, there are some very lesser known summons that I've probably played Final Fantasy VIII, I don't know, five, six times, and I just recently learned about them. And they are Boko the Chocobo and Moomba and Minimog, which all do various interesting things. But let's get back to E. Eden, speaking of gardens, and that actually segues nicely into the story aspect of the game. And as always, I'm not going to do anything like an in-depth plot analysis or whatever. There's tons of videos on the internet if you want to see that. Preferably, I'd like you to play the game yourself and make your own decisions. Don't ever trust other people blindly talking about how bad or good a game is because you might miss out on a game that you really love. But as always, I'll set up the scenario here in the world building elements and then talk about the main characters and the villain finally. So the story... Was well, there are a couple different story arcs in this game that are actually vastly different from one another, and they progressively get larger and larger in scope, eventually culminating in an incredibly grand, crazy plot point. But let's go ahead and set up the stage for the game. And there are these huge structures called gardens, which I alluded to earlier, and they are like a kind of college, educational, military institution that can be conscripted for various purposes. That being said, there are other like legitimate towns and there's quite a large political backdrop that goes on in the first, you know, two thirds of the game or so. And going off of that, there are two major storylines that are actually running concurrently with the game. One is where you play the main characters of the game, like we're going to talk about, but the other one is in the form of flashbacks, and there are some really important characters there. So as you go through the game, you're actually seeing more and more of the history of the game unfold, which is really cool. All that being said, most of the game goes all in, and this is the first game that really, really, really pushes the romance more than any other game has up to this point. While several games before this have had romance, Final Fantasy IV had the Kane Cecil Rosa Triangle, Final Fantasy VI had Locke and Celis and the others, and leading into Final Fantasy VII, there was a huge focus on the game with Eris, Tifa, and Cloud's triangle relationship. It's clear from the first time you pick up the physical copy of this game and look at it, it's going to be a love story simply from the logo on the box art. This is a huge turning point for the series and from this point on romance is going to be incredibly featured front and center of most of the games going forward. It never gets quite as front and center as Final Fantasy VIII but very nearly so. And you know what, I'll take that back, Final Fantasy X is just as romantically centered, if not more so, than Final Fantasy VIII. But hopefully I've made my point. I think this is one of the real big issues that a lot of people have with the game and series, really turning focus to that aspect, rather than the epic high fantasy storylines. Which this game does have, absolutely, but it's not the front and center. The world in this game is a lot more of a cleaner, kind of futuristic version than, say, Final Fantasy VI or VII. Those were kind of uh, gritty and dirty. This one is clean looking and feeling and is certainly the most inventive so far. And the more you play, the more awe-inspiring things become. They meld modern day sensibilities such as cars and cities that you could imagine as being in the real world with high magic and more and more into science fiction type of tropes as well as you get further in the game. It's certainly a more fantastical setting than say Final Fantasy XV where that game really really pushes a modern world with a little bit of fantasy thrown in. I love the world of Final Fantasy VIII, it's actually one of the most unique in the entire series as I've said, and what really draws you into the world is just how it's presented to you in the visuals and almost, if not actually more importantly, it's the music. Here I have to show my bias, I'm sorry, but hey, you know, it's my video so I'm gonna do what I want. So while the music of Final Fantasy of the franchise has always been amazing, I can say without a doubt that Final Fantasy VIII is the pinnacle of the franchise in terms of music. It's so good. Oh my god. Even those that detest Final Fantasy VIII usually still say that the music is some of the best of the series. And it's no reason why. I mean, you can see this coming from a mile away. Umatsu's absolutely firing on all cylinders here. It's a clear evolution from the amazing music of Final Fantasy 
7, where he was, you know, still learning the limitations of the PlayStation, whereas here he has a very firm handle on what he can and cannot do with the system, and he has produced pure gold. This can be heard in the very first moments of the game with the opening cinematic. Speaking of cinematics, same can be said on that front as well, whereas Final Fantasy 7 was testing the waters with the FMV, the full motion video here, they have again produced absolute gold in the form of their videos. Even to this day, few games rival the spectacle of what was produced here. I could do an entire video over cinematics, and you know what? I, I actually might do that. I hadn't really thought of it, but yeah, just look for that video in the future. Anyway, some of the best cinematics of the series would definitely be from this game, no doubt. Although other games have mind-blowing ones too, this game really pushed the boundaries in ways that hadn't been done before, even further than like Final Fantasy VII. All right, so enough of me gushing about the music and aesthetics and all of that, let's dive into the characters. Like Final Fantasy VI and VII before, the game is more focused on the characters rather than a job or class system in the mechanics. This game forsakes a job system pretty much completely, however, some of the characters still exhibit some of those jobs that we know and love, such as Quistus and her enemy skill blue magic kind of abilities. So first off, let's start with our main character, Squall Leonhardt, whose spirit has been carried over and evolved from Final Fantasy VII's counterpart of Cloud. Just to be clear, I'm not saying that Squall is like a literal incarnation of Cloud. That's No, that's not what I'm getting at. Uh, at least I don't think so. There may be some weird theory videos out there, but Squall himself is just a different aspect of that main character and how he begins the game and how he grows. And Squall itself is described as a violent gust of wind and as a verb, it's a shill cry of a baby or small child, which I'm sure a lot of people laugh at because a lot of people don't really like Squall, but that's okay. Squall is an interesting character, much like Cloud of Final Fantasy VII. He starts off the game not caring a lot about anything, but of course arcs happen and his character grows, specifically around our main heroine, which is Rhinoa. Rhinoa Hartley is a warm, upbeat, compassionate character, and she's introduced in the game in a really interesting way. There's a lot about Rhinoa here, and to be honest, Rhinoa is probably the main character of the game if you take in the entire story as a whole. And as much as I want to talk about Rhinoa's story, I don't want to spoil any of it, so that's really all I can say about her. It's just that everything hinges around her, so I don't want to give too much away. It's just too big of a minefield to, to go through. And Rhinoa's weapon is a sort of disc-based shooter, I guess. It's really weird. Super strange weapon. It kind of functions like a boomerang, for lack of a better word. Next up, we have Quistus, who I already mentioned briefly before. She's a really interesting character. She is portrayed as a child prodigy and the youngest instructor of Balam Garden, the garden that you start the game at. And her primary weapon is a whip, probably a callback to her blue mage-ish kind of origins here, dealing with monsters and enemy skills and all that. There are some artistic interpretations on the internet with that whip that has maybe depicted more of an interesting use of it, and I'll leave it at that because I do not want to get my channel flagged. Next up, we have Zeld Dinched, 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 Dinked, I don't know, D-I-N-C-H-T, however you pronounce it. Zell is basically everything that Squall isn't. <laughs> He's super energetic, loves to talk, and is essentially the resident monk of Final Fantasy VIII, if you want to call him that, dealing with enemies on a hand-to-hand -hand basis. He has a lot of moves and maneuvers taken from Tifa's library of moves, and oh yeah, he, you know, flagged the video, but he fucking loves hot dogs. Oh my god. I don't know of any character in literature, video game history that loves hot dogs as much as him. Maybe Sonic, maybe. <laughs> All right, he really, really, really likes hot dogs. One thing about Zell though, uh, well, honestly, not even about Zell himself, is that he basically appears later on in the series with a change of hair color and a fascination for Blitzball. And that's all I'll say about that right now. <laughs> it's, it's weird. Uh, next up, we have Selfie Tilmit, who is basically a female Zell. She is super upbeat, she has a short hairstyle, and is fairly clumsy. I guess it's not very Zell-like. But as far as characters go, I mean, if we're going to look back in the franchise, she wields nunchucks, and essentially, I guess she's a yuffie type of character in the way that she handles handles herself. However, unlike Yuffie, she actually has a knack for flying, and eh, in lieu of spoilers, that's all I want to say about that. She's kind of a mixed bag, with her limit break being slots, which have appeared in games before, like Kate Sith's slots in Final Fantasy VII and Setzer's from Final Fantasy VI. Unlike other characters, I don't really know how to associate her with any job due to her weapons and abilities and everything. It's kind of a mishmash of a bunch of different aspects that, I, I mean, they work out all right, I guess. Regardless, she's fun, positive, and upbeat. That's selfie. Next up, we have Irvine Kinius, a resident's long-range weapon user, initially from Galbedia Garden. He's met relatively late compared to all the other characters, and he's a classic sort of, uh, I don't know, I feel kind of weird saying this, but like a cowboy type character with a hat and duster to match. I'm, you come to Texas and you see cowboys and he, he's kind of like the pretty man 
Italian version of that, whatever. He has long brown hair, charming personality to boot, and essentially he's kind of like an Edgar type of character from Final Fantasy VI. Or if you haven't played Final Fantasy VI, he's a Han Solo-ish type of character, at least in terms of his charisma. And if you haven't seen Star Wars, then what what are you what are you even doing here with your life? Come on, man. Anyway, Urban is a fun character, and it's fun to experience watching the game play out around him. It's fun to have him in the party. But other than that, he's certainly nothing that we haven't really seen before. Aside from that, other guest characters join the party here and there, but again, they relate to the story, so I don't really want to spoil that. I guess before we leave the main characters, you may have remembered that I mentioned that we have quite a few flashbacks furthering the plot of the game, and I wouldn't normally talk about these, but it's such a huge part of the game that they deserve recognition, and those characters that are in the flashbacks are Laguna Lore, Ward Zabak, and Kira Siegel. Really, I'm just going to focus on Laguna here due to his incredible importance with the game, and for now, I'll just say that Ward and Kira are his best friends and leave it at that just for time's sake. So even then focusing on Laguna without spoilers this isn't going to be very long. Uh, during the game you're going to experience these so-called dreams where you're playing as Laguna himself and so whenever you the player meet Laguna he's a Galbadian soldier. Galbadia being one of the other major gardens of the game. Suffice it to say there's a ton of twists and turns here and this is a rather important part of the game so he ties into the main storyline in an incredibly major way later on and that's all I want to say about it. Actually, no. One more thing. During these sequences, we get one of, if not the best awesome battle songs ever to date in any game. It's been remixed a billion times. It's amazing. So finally, to end it off, we need to talk about the villain. I'll try to keep this as spoiler free as possible, but if you want to go ahead and skip ahead, just look for when the spoiler text go away. Again, there's not going to be a lot, but if you want to go in completely clear of not knowing anything about the villain, then skip ahead. So I'm going to essentially refer to the villain here as the sorceress, and this being relatively spoiler free. I really can't say much other than that. I guess one thing I can say though, as I did in one of my jobs videos featuring the time mage, I will firmly stand on the grounds that this sorceress is absolutely a time mage, which is awesome because I love time mages and they don't get their due. But this game, the biggest, fattest character is a time mage as a villain. And I'd even go as far to say that this villain is far, far more powerful than anything that we've seen in the franchise up until now, which I know I'm gonna get a lot of flack for this, but I think she makes up the most interesting and most powerful villain of the entire franchise. I'm sure 99% of people will disagree with me, but you know, hey, it's what I think and I'm sorry. So let's start wrapping up here. This is, oh my God, this is an incredibly long video. So Final Fantasy VIII is still to this day one of the most controversial games for a myriad of reasons. That being said, no game is without its faults, of course, but I get the feeling that the mechanics themselves really weren't to blame, or at least they weren't the top reason that the players were unhappy with the game. As always, the major part of Final Fantasy, at least in this point of its history, is the narrative. So if you don't buy into the romantic aspect of the game, you're probably not going to like it. And even then, I wouldn't say that that's the biggest source of the complaints. Like I said at the very beginning of the video, I think that the major culprit here is the twist of the game. And that's all I have to say about that. It's totally fine if you don't buy into the twist. Obviously, being narratively driven, it's all subjective. My personal thoughts on the game, though, are biased. This is the first game that I ever ever owned on my original PlayStation. Now, I did play many Final Fantasies beforehand, and I actually did play Final Fantasy VII all the way through on PC. But whenever I got a PlayStation afterwards, this was the first game, and it completely enveloped my life. The graphics were amazing, the story, the characters, the art, the full motion video, the music, all of it. I enjoyed this game so much for all of those reasons mentioned and more. The character personalities, I'll be honest, aren't top notch, but they do experience a lot of growth here. And just for that, it makes it interesting to me. The game has a special place in my heart despite all of the flaws that there are, and there are flaws, I'm not saying there aren't, but still, it's one of my most memorable games that I have played. And that's where I'm going to end it. So as we come to the end of the month of Titan with Final Fantasy VIII, I have to say this month has been a blast, and I enjoy doing these variety of topics during these months, and I'm always learning new things, which is really the point of this whole project. There's also another cause for celebration, as we are officially past the halfway marker of the project a year of Final Fantasy. I never thought I'd keep it going this long on a regular basis, but it turns out that I did, and it's been a wild ride so far, but we have so much more farther to go. So sit back and enjoy the best opening in any Final Fantasy, in my opinion, if not video games as a whole. This introduction is truly a masterpiece of gaming.